This is a map not many Indians have seen. Look at how expansive it is. Most of southern India, some parts of Sumatra in Indonesia, Malaysia to its north, and then Myanmar. Must have been a big shot empire, right? Well, it was. This is a map of the Chola Empire in the 9th century. We've all heard about them. They brought the Golden Age in Tamil Kingdom. But how did Chola kings conquer lands across the oceans? How did they beat kings in Indonesia or Malaysia? With a navy. Cholas were the pioneers of naval warfare in India. Their navy was unmatched in the Indian Ocean. But who came up with this plan? And why the invasion into Southeast Asia? Time for a flashback. Here's the thing about the Cholas. They rule for a long time, according to some, longer than any other empire. The first mention dates back to the 3rd century. Ashoka's edicts talk about the Cholas. Apparently, they were friends. But the Golden Age would start much later, around the 10th century. So would the love for ships. By then, the Cholas controlled the Indian Peninsula. The long coastline was theirs. So naturally, trade flourished. The Chola exports were in high demand all over the world. Things like spices, cotton cloth and ivory. My point is, they were loaded. This money was used to create the Golden Age. Chola kings supported poetry and arts. They built massive temples like this one in Tanjavur. They also designed efficient water systems and a civil service. But their biggest strength was the sea. The Cholas never had a standing navy. No warships, no gunboats. They only had trade ships. When the time came, these vessels would sail to war. You have to applaud their skill set. Modern ships are metal monsters, but back then it was all wood. And the Cholas knew exactly which ones to use. The jackfruit tree worked well. So did jamun, rosewood and maua. The Chola ships were made with rope and wood. It's a lost art today. There is neither interest nor demand for wooden ships. But simply making ships is not enough, is it? You need to know navigation. You need to survive at sea. Luckily, the Cholas were quick learners. They knew exactly what provisions to take on board. Things like dried meat, fish and rice flakes. They also had a neat trick to detect land. Chola sailors would take land-based birds on voyages, birds that prefer being on land than water. Every now and then, they would release these birds. If they came back, bad news. There was no land nearby. But if they kept flying, great. Because that meant there was land somewhere near. Talk about ingenuity. As for navigation, they used staple methods like following stars or aligning with constellations. Thus, the Chola navy flourished. They explored new lands and stationed diplomats there. Even China had a Chola emissary. So you've got a big navy, you've got the navigation skills, you've also got efficient ships. In the hands of the right king, it would be a powerful tool. Again, the Cholas were lucky because they had two of them, Raja Raja Chola and his son Rajendra Chola. Let's look at the elder one first. He came to power in the year 985. He reigned for close to 30 years. Under him, the kingdom expanded. Most of the present-day southern states were annexed. Next, he set his eyes on Sri Lanka. Raja Raja Chola invaded the Sinhalese kingdom. He also raised its capital. But he couldn't finish the job. As he moved south, the Cholas faced fierce resistance. So only northern Sri Lanka was conquered. Good start, though. Raja Raja Chola set his empire on a path of expansion. By the end of his reign, he controlled the Maldives and Lakshwadeep. If Rajaraja was good, his son was even better. That's Rajendra Chola. He expanded north, south and east. Rajendra came to power in the year 1014. His first order of business? Completing his father's Sri Lankan campaign. He did so with speed and force. Entire cities and religious centres were wiped out. The Sinhalese barely saw it coming. Yet Lanka was just a teaser. Rajendra's true ambitions were much bigger. He established settlements all over Southeast Asia and Thailand, Malaysia and Indonesia. He was also not afraid to flex his naval muscles. The opportunity came in the year 1025. Most of Southeast Asia was ruled by the Sri Vijaya Empire. They were based here, in the island of Sumatra. But why exactly did Rajendra invade? It's a question that historians are unable to answer to this day. There seem to be three theories. One, Rajendra was like any other ambitious ruler. He wanted to expand his kingdom. Two, he wanted to control the trade route to China. Apparently, the Sri Vijaya rulers were interfering, trying to intimidate Chola ships. So maybe Rajendra decided to teach them a lesson. Or three, 
some medieval geopolitics. The Khmer king, Suryavarman, had approached Rajendra for help. He was troubled by another regional kingdom. So Suryavarman's rival got to know of it. And what did he do? He asked the Sri Vijaya Empire for help. Maybe this extended rivalry forced Rajendra to invade. Whatever the reason, the result was spectacular. It was a 2,300 kilometer long journey, so give or take 30 days. The Chola fleet sailed from Nagapattinam to Malaysia. It was a naval blitzkrieg. Sri Vijaya had no idea what hit them. The Cholas used the monsoon winds to sail from city to city. They had a set routine, attack, plunder, leave. They had no interest in staying behind to rule. It's hard to imagine how this war unfolded. The Chola ships did not have catapults or slings, but they could carry soldiers, elephants and horses. So chances are they landed and then attacked. Rajendra took back untold riches from Sri Vijaya, also their prized war elephant. Any military historian would be proud of this invasion. It left Sri Vijaya and Southeast Asia broken. The monopoly was over. Chola influence in the region can be seen even today in temples, in poetry, and in works of art. The Cholas indeed heralded a golden age. Their economy was unmatched, their navy was unrivaled, and their rulers were ambitious. How then did this empire collapse? When the bigger you get, the more enemies you have. Cholas had plenty of them, the Pandyas, the Deccan kings, the Sinhalese. It was too much to handle. So in the year 1279, the Chola dynasty ended. But their story shouldn't have. The Chola seafarers don't find enough chapters in our history books. Their invasion of Southeast Asia barely finds a mention. It's unfortunate, but true. But today the story is more relevant than ever before. India has ambitious naval plans, plans to dominate the Indian Ocean. The same ocean that Rajendra Chola once ruled over. It's a legacy that India must rediscover. It's a legacy that India must build on.